Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, when I've uh, sometimes done these events, it's always been a, a bit of a crapshoot in terms of if I have to go after lunch has been served in terms of the audience. But I know that we have a great speaker for you, so I think we're all going to be very, uh, it's going to be very informative. So I have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing John, bon John Van Nostrand. John is the, uh, the founding principal of SVN, a leading planning and architecture company. Over the last four decades, he's been the driving force behind the firm's domestic and international architecture planning and urban design practice. So John has extensive experience leading large multidisciplinary consulting teams on complex regional planning and rural and urban development projects across Canada and around the world, including a number uh, of major mine-related housing projects in Africa, Latin America, and Canada. And John's work has been uh, recognized with a number of national, international awards, uh, including but not limited to a World Leadership Award for Town Planning, a World Habitat Award, uh, Award from the UN Habitat, and also many City of Toronto uh, Urban Design Awards. A lesser known fact is that uh, over 40 years ago, he and our moderator, Mr. Uh, Bill Humber, were colleagues at the North Pickering Newtown Project. There's a little trivia for you. Thanks for that, Bill. So John brings a renewed perspective on the Boreal Corridor region of Canada, uh, a conversation with deep roots in our, in our nation's history. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, John to this year's Green Citizen Conference. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean, and um, thank you, TD. And thank you, Irvin, for reintroducing. I had no idea. I know Irvin's writing. I had no idea what he was going to talk about, but it's sort of the perfect precursor to what I'm going to talk about, um, which is sort of, so there's a situation. How do we get, what are we going to do about that? So. I just call it Growing Canada. I also had no idea you were also involved in the, the 100 million notion. Uh, I'm on the advisory council of the Century Initiative, so, uh, but I, I had no idea that Bill had picked it up. It's taken us 35 years to house 70,000 people at North Pickering, so we got a long way to go still. It, I just told Bill, they just started construction of it. We started working in 1974, so just to put it in perspective. Um, so, and I call this a national growth plan because that's what we really need. We, we now know where, what's before Canada, what the challenges are. How do we look at developing, I don't know what else to call, but a national growth plan because we're really growing. Um, and I'll say, unlike Irvin, I'm long-winded, lots of pictures, probably too much text, and parts of it I'll brush over. There are some remnants in here there was a competition last year run by, founded by Bookfield for infrastructure ideas for Canada, big ideas. Um, and we entered this project and, and, and we, didn't, we didn't win, but we will win uh, at some point. I mean, Canada will win, I hope. So it's a little bit different kind of talk than the one you saw this morning and I hope I'm half as articulate. So. Again, you may know this, and I may be talking to people who know everything about 100 million, but I always enjoyed this op the website for uh, Century Initiative, and it puts three options in front of you. It says, today we're 37 million people. If we decide to have zero immigration, and there are lots of countries who are talking about zero immigration, by 2100, we would be 19 million people. If we said, let's just go with the status quo, let's just grow as we are growing, we would be about 54 million people. And our GDP in the first round would be zero, or 0.21. Our GDP in the second one, and GDPs have been in question now as a measure of anything, but let's just say it still holds, is about 1.5, which is well below where we usually are. If I read my economist correctly, we're always around 2.5. In order to be 2.5, we need a million people on top of all the other reasons. So there's a real economic incentive here as well, um, and obviously a big focus on immigration. Um, if we look at Canada's population growth compared to the other G8 countries, we're at the top of it. A lot of people don't realize that. We also live, I think, in the second, depends who you're talking to, but the second or third fastest growing region ourselves. 
So we're learning about growth. All your work is about growth, I'm sure, to the extent it's to do involving planning and servicing and housing and whatever. But we're not alone. We're, we're actually leading the world in growth. And we're a model in a way, too. Um, but another interesting thing about our growth is that this sort of chart, complex chart, shows you natural growth, that is internal growth patterns in blue, and the effects of immigration in red. So we, like Japan, our internal population has been dropping since the early 60s, except our immigration has been going up never as high as it was in 1905 to 1920, never, not quite as high as it was after the Second World War, but nevertheless steady. And I think we're looking, if you, and I'll give you some figures in a moment, but if, if the 100 million is a target and the natural population is growing, I think you'll see there's a lot of immigration coming. And that's a major opportunity in front of us. And one that actually we're not that unfamiliar with. It's all been about immigration um, and how we deal with those peaks. But you can see that our growth is driven by immigration, not by natural, natural growth rates. We have one important portion of our native, excuse the, excuse the word, but our local population, our natural population, that is growing and growing dramatically, and that is at indigenous nations. So indigenous nations now exceed their estimated population at contact, contact point, and they're growing rapidly. And I think you can see the, the signs of that all around you, uh, and not just in Regina and Winnipeg, people sort of think, those are the places. Pretty well every community we've worked in in, in middle Canada, is, there are now majority indigenous populations, even though Census Canada doesn't want to quite realize that, since they're not really at home. They're in, they're in Thompson. Uh, well, they're always in Thompson. Well, no, no, they go home. We just did the census. Uh, they were here for the weekend doing shopping, and there's always a lot of them. Well, no, they're here, living here. And um, so this is sort of why, and you will even, there are 80,000 First Nations students living in Toronto at the moment. So just at that level alone, you can see it's a significant population. And you can see why they're the fastest growing population, just from the old bell curve. And you can see the bulk uh, are younger, and they're coming up. At the same time, when the top, our own, let's say, native or natural population growth is bulky at the top and leaving. So for instance, we're doing an interesting project right now, which is to do with a, a town called Hearst and a First Nations called Constance Lake and a mine that would be built in between the two of them. And the plan is about who will benefit from the mine. And we've discovered after the tension itself of Hearst, for example, saying, you don't really need to talk to Constance Lake. We know what we're doing. And Constance Lake saying, uh, you know, we don't know what you're talking about, and, but we're interested. But of course, Hearst is dying out. Constance Lake is growing. So it's just a natural take over our, the two of them need to get together. And they will, and they'll get together around the mine, in part because now, thanks to people like Bob Ray, more and more mines produce a product for First Nations. Part of the revenues, the royalties, will be 20% for First Nations in the, in, the, in the Ring of Fire now. By the way, that's a very normal situation in Africa and Latin America, well, Africa for sure, is that royalties are distributed. Of course, you have a majority indigenous population. So I often say, people say, well, have you ever worked with First Nations? And I say, well, I've, I've worked in countries run by First Nations. Does that count? I know what they do when they come into power, and they really make sense, and they really make sure their people are looked after properly, and they really care about the non-First Nations people in their country, um, in spite of what happened. Um, so I think there's. It's all a very interesting time. So there's, there are, again, those immigration levels over the last 150 years. And that big spike is 1905, 1920. Of course, what's interesting, it doesn't show the kind of racial side of this. And it's an important one. And I think also it's important to explain why we're all up against the border as well as just the United Americans are there. We're a British colony. We still are a British colony, I think, mentally. I would, I only, I'm not saying that to be a wise guy. I've worked in 30 of them. I realize, for instance, I work with the same Planning Act, 1937 Town and Planning, Town and Country Planning Act applies in all 37. Indigenous peoples, be they the majority, South Africa, or the minority, Canada, they get treated exactly the same way. They're ignored, 
and power, no power to cities, because cities are people, places where people gather like this, they talk, they foment rebellion. They have ideas, and they want to do things differently. So you look at the voting patterns across Canada, always the cities are different than the rest of the province. Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, they're always anti. They're fighting each other. The NDP thriving in one or the other. NDP are big in the nickel belt and big in the heart of the cities. It's interesting. But it was a largely United Kingdom population. Even though you may be Catholic and Irish or Scottish uh, or Protestant, you all spoke English and you all knew who the queen was and knew what she was about and you certainly understood crown land. Um, so there was a commonality between, between people at that point. And, and that part of the city, and I, it's another whole talk to go into, but that whole period of growth was largely, well, I was, it was described to me in planning school as being ad hoc and piecemeal, meaning that people built, people subdivided land, they built small houses, they added on to them over time, and they, they enlarged. So we, we ended up with those crummy piecemeal communities like Cabbage Town. Cabbage Town was the model for Andrus Draney when he came to this region to do his, his first uh, new urbanism. He thought Cabbage Town was the best community. He modeled, it on, he modeled Cornell on Cabbage Town. And of course, those are the most sought after communities today, those owner built communities. And it's another side topic, but it is interesting to note that by 1950, in any Canadian city, somewhere between 45 and 55% of the population had built their own house. 80 to 90% of them had a room or a border. In the Depression, they had three. By 2000, zero, absolutely zero. And it's a nice, quaint sort of historic issue, but it's actually an issue to do with planning, fundamentally, because Somebody decided between 1930, between 1950 and 1970 that the city was a bad place. It was a British planner, of course. Toronto always had British planners. Up until 1972, the city of Toronto would go to England every, every spring and hire the planning staff, because what did Canadians know about planning? Bill and I worked in a project that for the first 25 years was run by an English planning firm, because what did we know about planning? We, didn't, we, didn't have, we knew nothing. And, and that planner came out in 1945 and said, we just finished the plan in London, we want to do the same here. What you, what, what, what's important about the London plan is there are a lot, the, the city is a bad place. It's full of slums and people. We need to tear those, peri, peri, we, need to, we need to introduce urban renewal where we displace them, put them in public housing, and all of us need to move out to garden cities around the edge. They were called various things, but Garden Cities, I think, is the overall term. The 1945 plan for Toronto said exactly that. We need to play, we need to destroy, we need to tear down all the land between Queen and Jarvis from the Humber to the, to the uh, Dawn. The Regent Park was just the very tip of that iceberg. It was supposed to be, Regent Park is about one-tenth of what was supposed to happen in that period. I grew up in Hamilton. They tore down the entire downtown as, as a part of urban renewal. I think it's partly why I ended up doing what I'm doing, because I was a teenager at the time watching this happen. And only now is it really recovering in Hamilton. I would say only now are big parts of Toronto recovering, and they're certainly, and they're full of that public housing. Meanwhile, those first generation UK people who were doing pretty well by then moved out to Don Mills, moved out to the seven um, suburbs that were laid out, the, the, the garden cities around. And they bought into them because the rule was nothing would change. All, everything would be finished for you. If you bought a house, everything would be there. If you needed to change it, you had to get permission from Mr. E.P. Taylor and Don Mills. Or if you did change it, you could only paint it one of three colors, grass green, sky blue, or earth brown. And the downtown people flocked out to those areas. That was described in my planning school as being fully planned community. And that was the kind of model that I grew up with. Nobody mentioned that somebody bought, they also had their own employment areas. They're still there. The, the, so Don Mills is surrounded by a large one. The, the owner of the property is, who bought a property on Winford went to, Mr. Mil, went to Mr. Taylor and said, I bought a house here, my senior managers, but I need 125 workers to make my widget. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go back in the city and find them and I need a bus. And Mr. Taylor said, no, 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 no. No, our advertising is we're, we're a village six miles out of Toronto. I've just arranged 
the Eglinton will not be paved, it'll be a gravel road, and so will the Wilkett Creek. Leslie will be, so you drive in a, a country road to us. We don't want to have buses out here. And his architects and planners, who were all over Don Mills, because who gets to design a town completely from scratch? Um, and, and he said, this guy said, and my problem is all the, the, the cheapest housing you have is only affordable to the top 35% of the population. That's why I need to go and get my workers elsewhere. And they said, no, we could do what they do in Europe. Look at Stockholm. They cleared seven clearings around the city, and they built these things called high-rise towers by this guy called Le Corbusier. And workers really like them. And they go home at night, and they go home on the weekend, and we don't have to deal with them. They get in and out by train. So you should buy Thorncliffe Racetrack, and you should put a town there, one of those. And so they made a direct copy of Vallingby, Sweden, and popped it onto the racetrack. And that was the first uh, of, so, so first of all, so fully planned, was fully planned for 35%, unplanned for 65. And the answer was towers. So we built 1,000 towers in 15 years. We have the most towers of any region in North America and most of Europe. And you can be pretty sure they're all from that period. They are all from that period. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, that, that whole change meant that the second generation of immigration was treated quite differently. We're looking at the third generation. We're working quite a bit in Hamilton. I'm from Hamilton, as I mentioned earlier, alluded to. Hamilton, the second largest uh, language spoken in Hamilton since 1964 has been Italian, till last year it became Arabic. <clears throat> that has profound impact of this next generation. And the question is, at that level, are we going to put them back in those towers, or are we going to figure out something else? So what we're facing there, I, it's just 2016, we had 36.3 million, 50 to 60 percent immigration. 2050 will be up to 45 to 60 and 2100. If that happens, and we hope it does, we're up to 90 to 100 million. 60 to 80 percent of that increase will be through immigration. So that number below, which is hidden, is quite high. So we're dealing with immigration in a big, big way. So it strikes me with those numbers, one has to, even in the GTA in 2006, when we thought our population was getting out of control, we, st we stopped back and said, hold it, hold it, hold it. We need a growth plan for our region. By the way, I think it's a very good model growth plan. And, 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 but even it will have trouble dealing with this, as we'll see shortly. Um, but I, I came to believe that growth plans were needed, not just at a, national, not just at a regional level, but at a national level in this case, and I think at a neighborhood level as well. And so we're actually doing two neighborhood growth plans right now so people understand what's going to go on when they're double, the, the population doubles rather than just say we don't want it to happen and they can go somewhere else. So my talk is really about that growth plan. So there's been a dramatic increase as we've seen. And it's not just, I can go right to here. This is my diagram of what's going on in Canada, which is, which is not the, the box, but it is the box in another version of it, of what's really going on. So you have what I call the urban front, is the red belt across the border, where we have 90% of our population at the moment. Then I'm going to talk about the boreal corridor, which is not my idea. For those who were around in 1967, you'll remember it as something called Mid-Canada Corridor. It was introduced by a guy called General Richard Romer. But also, we have the Northwest Passage opening up, as we've heard this morning. But we also, we have planning already going on on the sea coast. It's called the Asia Pacific Gateway and Corridor. And we have already planning underway on the E boundary, which is called the Atlantic Gateway and Atlantic Corridor. And you may not have heard those terms. They're sort of, that work is happening largely at an environmental level first, which should be good, but I, I think it, it, it should be done together with the urban, urban level as well. But, and of course, the North, Northwest Passage is, is, is an obvious, probably within the next two or three years, we will be hearing, well, we're already beginning to hear about the first boats that have gone through. As I mentioned this morning, we're ill prepared for it because you've got Russia on their coast with six ports. 
Norway's got four. We've got zero. Um, China is looking to buy, try to buy a big port site last year in Greenland. It was turned down, but managed to buy, buy one in Jamaica, which is at the mouth of the Panama Canal, which they put a lot of money into over the last 10 years. They're infrastructure people. They understand diagrams like this. They build them. Um, so they will, they will find a port out there, and you can get two days from the coast of China to the coast of Greenland. So you can see that there's a lot of activities going to go on. So that's the context. And I think a national growth plan will reestablish a balance between Canada's social, economic, and environmental futures. And I think we vastly need that. It's not an environmental issue alone. And it's not a population growth. It's these, all these. It's social, economic, and environmental. Address the lack of east-west and north-south infrastructure. We have a great infrastructure right along that in the front. But after that, there's very little. There's some arms that reach up. One went to the Yukon, of course. One went to Alaska first, which wasn't even our idea. What got up to that coast that way? We need to boost regional, it'll boost regional and local economic growth and job creation through investment in the Boreal Corridor infrastructure. It'll decentralize population growth and, as a result, reduce pressures on infrastructure within the urban front. Lots of dis interesting discussion about that this morning. How can we deal with this growth? Why would people go up north? These are, these are important questions, and I'll, we'll come back to them. We'll provide a higher quality of life for existing and future northern residents. Extremely important. The last time, as I said, we were working in for the Kikatalik Corporation. The last time I went up there, I flew up with two dentists who go up every month to do all the dental work, and none of it, because no Canadians will do it. They're making a fortune. They said they work three days a week, and they relax the rest of the time on the money they're making looking after northern teeth. Introduce high-speed internet. God forbid it's everywhere else in the circumpolar region except here. Uh, lower installation costs and allow local economies to thrive. Above all, to be created on a nation-to-nation -nation basis, it has to be indigenous nations and our chosen nation, our, our, sorry, our um, what's the word you use? our elected nation or our democratic nation or whatever, implemented in stages. And I think that's a very critical thing that I'll, come, I'll talk about when we keep going on. So that gives you just a diagram of the curtain state between the urban front and the boreal forest. So the, green, the, the yellow is the boreal forest as it was originally defined by Richard Romer. And the purple, pink, of course, is the uh, is the interesting, I mean, is, is, is our bulk of our growth really interesting? I'll come back and talk about that big bulge out west and what we did then, what Canada, how Canada approached that growth, um, because I think it's a bit of a model for what we have to do in the future. So part one is just about the urban front. And I, actually, we've, um, I think Irvin's already really scooped me on this, but that is the urban front. That's, those are the lands we're talking about. 90% of our population. Just to give you a sense of if we went to 100 million more, more precisely, where would that growth take place? And those are, it would largely take place on a regional basis. I think we all agree with that. Cities would be hubs of those regions, but it has to happen on a regional basis. Those are the major reasons, regions. And if you look at some of those numbers, they're unbelievable, really. I mean, that, that Toronto, would be 33.5 million, as Irvin said this morning, um, in the middle of Canada's richest agricultural area and surrounded by one of its most successful green belts. It's just impossible. Um, no matter how high we can build, we're just not going to manage that. Nor do I believe we're going to manage Calgary going to 15 million or Montreal to 12. Um, the Toronto region would grow in that scenario from the 9.5 million today to the 13 it's supposed to be in 2040, well on the way to that, but up to 33 million by 2100. So the, like the, pop, the whole population of most of Canada now would be in, comparable population would be in Toronto. 60-80% would, would be through immigration, so that's 4 to 19 million newcomers. We have a great growth plan. I, I worked on it with others, I'm sure, in the room. It's, it's, I think it's terrific. Um, but it's nowhere, it, it has no, it doesn't go forward and beyond, at the moment, I think about 2056 max. And certainly doesn't, uh, isn't there to deal with 
33.5 million. So I think we do have to look at other, other answers, uh, other, other sources of growth, other places for growth. And um, as I'm going to suggest, one of those are those other three fronts. But I've in particular focused on the mid-Canada as a belt uh, where growth could occur. So part two is what, what I call at least a development plan for the Boreal Corridor because I'm going to just take off my jacket here. So Mid-Canada Corridor, as it was called, was put on the table in 1967 by Richard Romer. And I'll give you his reasoning in, very, in his map form. The great majority of Canadians live within 300 miles of the border. So even 67, that was true. And he showed that pretty clearly and where railways went and where they didn't go. Mid-Canada is dominated by the, by the boreal forest. And the interesting thing about the boreal forest that he didn't mention but is that it's circumpolar. That, bo that forest goes right around the top of the world. So it's the same forest that Sweden and Finland and Russia, that people live in there. And that was his other point, even without knowing that, that actually the climate of Canada, relatively speaking, in the Boreal Corridor is temperate. He said it was temperate enough in 1967. It was comparable with large parts of Scandinavia already. Of course, it's gotten even warmer. So it's a habitable area and is becoming more habitable climate-wise. And then he pointed out the really, the really important things that 75% of our natural resources, be it timber or mining, et cetera, are located within the natural mid-Canada corridor and 75% of our Aboriginal population. So what an amazing kind of coincidence of, of factors. Now, he happened to put this on the table as a conservative, an arch conservative, the year Pierre Trudeau was, became our, our prime minister, and so this got shelved completely. There was a big conference up at Lakehead, but it, I picked it up, uh, and, he, and he said, and we need a plan for it, and it's something like this, was sort of the rough version of it. We need to get a corridor through there, a multi-purpose corridor. There are new growth nodes, and we should be really, really thinking about this. So in 1914, I, I, I picked up that map and I said, so what actually has been happening here since 1967 without any planning? And if you read that carefully, you'll see that pretty well every important resource feature of Canada is in that corridor, be it the old one, be it already existing, or new, starting with the oil sands. The oil sands are in that corridor. The nickel, the Thompson nickel belt, the ring of fire is in that corridor. Uh, the older Timmins Sudbury nickel belt is in there. The newer iron ore nickel belts of, of northern Quebec are in there. And of course, the oil and gas and the prairies are, uh, of the east coast are there. And in fact, so if you look at projects that have emerged or are still emerging, the northern gateway, which includes uh, Kitimat and what was just announced last week there, Mackenzie River Valley, where there's been a lot of, I'm sure Irvin, when he says he's spending a lot of time up in Whitehorse, and it's because of the mining booms there. The oil sands itself, themselves, northern Manitoba, the ring, what I've just said, and, and what's, what are the resources in all those areas? So um, it struck me that, wow, the guy was right. And that was the point where my phone rang, and I picked it up, and he said, I heard a voice in the other saying, you thought I was dead, didn't you? I'm not. I'm 92 years old. I'm sitting in my legal office in Collingwood. I love your article. It was Richard Romer. And I did think he was dead. But he's very much alive. He still is very much alive. And I think so there is a kind of more picturesque view of the corridor. Um, obviously, it, it does call just being, the, being itself a container of the boreal forest along with these minerals is itself challenge number one. You are definitely dealing with social, economic, and ec environmental issues as of right. <clears throat> so in 
So the sort of context I gave was that it, it would be a plan, the development plan would be driven by increasing indigenous autonomy and population and economic growth, so them remaining in place, and I think that's very much the way things are playing out uh, in terms of the first, the indigenous nations, driven first of all by the Inuit who, who negotiated uh, ownership of their traditional lands. We work for the Kikatel Corporation, as I said earlier. They are the largest uh, public, private landowners in the world because the land they had traditionally is the largest part of Nunavut. Unlike the more southern First Nations who had trouble except on the west coast where the, the, the treaties were not so strong. Economic growth through increase in my immigration, so that's a very important part of this. Addressing climate change through denser, more sustainable housing, placing indigenous communities in, in, in charge of natural land, so that's a, a latent idea. I think that in Africa, when I worked in Ghana on mines, the royalty distribution went, first of all, to the federal government, second of all, to the regional government, third to the municipal government, and fourth of all, to the chiefs of the First Nations in that community. And, and, and it was significant at that, even what they got was plenty to build their own housing and look after themselves, so I think it's an important. And I think a mining res renaissance, the mining community would say, in terms of new markets for electric cars and zinc and lithium, cobalt, chromium, those kinds of things. But in turn, the BCB, to go back to the bigger picture, is an important stepping stone to the Arctic and the east and west corridors from the, from the front itself. So you don't just jump over it to go up to those places. You need to use it. And, and also just remember that all those resources, people, when I presented to the Liberal government before the last election, they kind of, one of them sort of mocked me and said, this has nothing to do with our cities. And cities are, they're driven by culture, not by, by what's in the resource in the, in, the, in the belt. And I said, are you kidding? I said, the economies of Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, Regina, Toronto, Montreal, St. John's, are all driven by resources that are bought down, the money's bought down and distributed from there. But they all rely intimately on that corridor. The Guggenheim Partners said last year that North American Arctic will require a trillion of infrastructure investment in the next decade, and that, but that North America, Northern Canada, represents one of the safest new investments markets in the world. So that's a very significant point to go along with what we were talking about this morning. The BCC, B, the Boreal Corridor and Northern Hubs, as well as air, ship, rail, and road links and ro broadband connection are more likely to happen by working together, not going at them separately. So need for the growth plan. Some of these are already underway, such as a proposed new highway from Yellowknife to Grays Harbor, and none of it, et cetera. So there are signs of that. And the first, the Inuit nation and the First Nations are talking much about these kinds of corridors and reestablishment of their original lands. <clears throat> the BCB will be developed at all levels of government and private sector through private-public partnerships. It needs seed capital, it needs private capital, it needs public capital, public investments in infrastructure to foster. Um, and all of these sound like theoretical, but I'll show you in a moment what we did last time we had a situation like this. The Boreal Corridor to be a success will need a proper engagement plan, environmental and infrastructure plans. I'm sure these are all divisions of Seneca that you're producing people to deal with this kind of, these kinds of situations. Population and employment projections, very difficult when you're trying to do that around resources and integrated development plans. It would be created and developed on a nation-to-nation -nation basis, including all indigenous nations focusing on the expansion of not only Canada's existing urban regions, but also the coastal corridors. And it'll be the first plan to direct newcomers to live in Canada's emerging economic areas, as opposed to flying others in and out. You know, I was startled last year when I heard the Minister of Immigration talk about his two biggest problems. I thought he said it's immigration from, from Middle East. He said, one is fly in, fly out labor. We have 700,000 people flying into Canada, making a lot of money and taking it to some other country. And then it's, it's international education, people flocking here to learn, learning, and leaving. And he thought those were not the two biggest problems, the two biggest opportunities that we should be working with at an immigration level. I think it's interesting to remember that after the Second World War, when immigrants came, uh, of course, the, the ones from the UK got put to the cities. But others, my friends from Estonia and Lithuania, got sent to some place called Geraldton because they run forestry operations in Lithuania and Estonia. So they started the forestry operations there, and they were put there to do that. 
Others got put into farming. Others got put into mining. So there was a directing that goes on, that went on, that we, of course, sort of kept quiet about. But the idea that of this morning that you would direct immigrants to places where there are skills, imagine saying, well, all the stevedores could go to the Arctic Ocean coast, because that's going to be one heck of an economy going by you every day there. Interesting. Um, BCB assumes that 5 or 10% of Canada's growth will be attracted to live in the corridor. So that's 5 to 10% of um, 70 million, over and above the 2 million that are there, and another 10 or 20% 20 by 2100. The result will be a population increase through immigration of up to 6.5 and 14 million new residents in the corridor. That's still excluding growth further up and in the, in the boundaries outside. Combined with natural population increases across, we estimate that these populations could generate GDPs of 300 to 700 billion by 2050 and 2100, respectively. So we try to give a real economic argument to this with working with economists, not just a sort of theoretical. We estimate the BCP will cost 10 to 50 million per kilometer to build in built up areas, and approximately 10 to 15 percent of the corridor will be located in these areas. <clears throat> Stakeholders are indigenous people, of course, to secure, a sh and they need to secure a, a share, their share of resource royal royalties, at least 20%. The Cree and Quebec have been getting 10%, 15% for the last 15 years already, but that's Quebec, and Quebec has a much stronger relationship in many respects with its First Nations. But they also should be responsible, they're the ones who should be responsible for their traditional lands and resources, their own food, and managing and husbanding sensitive, no-go, government areas on behalf of residents and tourists, et cetera. Resource companies are needed to lead the mining and harvesting of resources, employing local and First Nations. But a perfect model for me is Fort Mackay, which is a First Nation we worked with. It sits in the middle of the oil sands. It's done extremely well in that position. And then, of course, governments and councils. We also need stakeholders. We need, we need round tables. And I use this as just an example of a round table we did a, a major project in Thompson, and it's a round table that really is a round table, includes all the players, each with one vote. Um, and um, it was a wonderful thing up there. We had, a, you know, we had our first meeting of that table was, uh, and it was chaired by the, by the mayor of, of Thompson. And they had to decide, well, how do we make decisions? And the mayor said, well, I've been thinking about this overnight, so we've got to establish what is our voting power. And he said, so we're Thompson, we get four votes. And everybody, nobody said, well, what, where'd you get? They just, they just sort of, ooh. And the next was a woman who was a lead, led one of the Métis nations, uh, Métis Regional Council. And she said, let me just think, Mr. I guess that puts us at eight. I said, what? You know, and as he went around, by the end, by the time I got around, everybody had one vote. Because the numbers were just, you know, they had no idea that Thompson would call itself the hub of the north. They never figured out what, who was the wheel. The wheel were 80,000 Aboriginal people, which were actually driving the economy of Thompson. So, and I think, speaking on the more, you know, we need a, we probably need something like a Boreal Heritage Fund, and we need a Boreal University. So, enabling the plan, and this is where I, I want to show what we did the last time we were faced with a dilemma that we decided as a public we wanted to do some. So I call it Canada's last national corridor which, of course, is that corridor we all see before us. How can we learn from that? There, the resources were wheat, so it was sort of clear. But what's really, really interesting is that the government planning used Crown land as the asset. So there, they divided the land up, of course. They had to create the new Dominion Land Survey, which respected the curvature of the earth. But the distribution of land, the sections, what they did is they, they said, the railway, you have to front the line, but we're going to pay you back with land. For every mile of railway, you get 10,000 acres of land. Its value will have increased because you put the railway there, and you can sell it, and you'll pay for the railway plus, plus, plus. There were some abuses of that. There's no question, mostly from people from Toronto who took advantage of it. But it was a brilliant idea. And Hudson's Bay should get some land because we're looking to them who else is going to put stores out there or who's going to look after this area commercially? And we need something for school, so we give them land as well. So all this land is going to be settled, but the value of settlement will up its value, and that will get turned into. 
It's a bit like when the British settled Upper Canada, they, d they created Crown and Clergy Reserves. I would say for reasons of control, we don't talk about that part, but the idea was when you came to a township and you had to build a school, you could sell some of the Crown lands and pay for the school. What do you think the percentage of Crown land is from the boreal forest up? Actually, in the whole of Canada, it's 89%. 41 is owned by the provinces and 49 by the uh, federal government. And when I heard that, I was shocked. I don't even know how we can call ourselves a country. Anyway, I'm suggesting, why don't we use the same method to pay for the infrastructure and the improvements we need through the Boreal Corridor and through Northern Canada? Turn it into the asset it really is, and there's no better asset than land. So, and here's what they did. So they built these corridors. These are the train corridors. This just gives you a quick picture. This is about a 30-year period of the West. And that channel through there, that's the train line in 10, heck, 10 miles on either side, which were the lands, the railways controlled to pay for the railway. The dots are all, by the way, the priority was given to people from the United Kingdom within the corridor and alongside it. Irish were a little bit outside the corridor. All the others, the Finns, the, 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 all those other people that went west, you know, the Ukrainians, they're those little dots that are out fending for themselves in other sections. There it is, um, you know, that's five years later, that's about 10 years later, and that's 1931. So 1931 to 1918. So incredibly successful. And I'm sure if we had been sitting here in, in, in whatever the bidding you have, no, 1880, and said, you, sh you should settle this. It'll, they said, nobody will ever go there. There's nothing there. In fact, Palliser went out and came back and said there is nothing there. A, it's a drought. He was right. He went out in a drought year, and there was nothing there. Fortunately, the next, the tr Grand Trunk sent another person out two years later in a good year and said, guess what? I hope you don't mind, but I staked this rail corridor already because this is the best place to grow wheat. Nobody ever heard. They weren't looking for wheat. They were just looking for, what do you grow here? So I think it's a really, really interesting model, really successful. There's 700 towns and villages in, in the prairie still, and they've really boomed because they've become the places where you live in the oil sands, the potash development. And guess what? Now the First Nations are taking over those towns for themselves because they need to expand, and some of them are being abandoned. So they've had a long term, lots and lots of lessons. And then every eight miles, because somebody decided to really collect the grain properly, you had to enlight, get to the near, farthest farm and back in daylight. And that distance means you've got to be, in October, means you've got to be, you, that's four kilometers, four miles. So every eight miles, somebody built one of those big red things. But they also did a town plan. It didn't cost them anything. They didn't try and make a town. They just put the town plan in. And all the towns have grown up in those plans. There's Tisdale, for example. But all those towns out there are all in a very, very simple, cost-effective, paid-for-itself settlement for a very successful prairie community. So I think it's, I think it's a, uh, an important precedent. And I'm just going to jump ahead because there's a lot of other stuff here. But I think what I want to say is that what does this all mean that we should be doing? In addition to planning, I think there's some really, some really fundamental policies, which I call an appendix which is how I presented this to the Senate when I had the opportunity to do that. So first of all, we need to set the tables. That is, we need to set round tables up for community, regional, provincial, national levels to discuss and promote integrated regional development. I worked in, for 10 years in Uganda. And when I first went there, it was the end of 20 years of war. They had a thing called the RC councils. And there was an RC council for the block. There was an RC council for the neighborhood. There was an RC council for the district. There was an RC council for the city. And there was an RC council for the region. And I said, Jesus, the, the, the Cubans have been here or something. This revolutionary council. Oh, no. No, that's how we were organized before the British came here in 1860. And they had exactly the same portfolio at each level. In your neighborhood, was somebody responsible for water and sewage. And in, the, in my neighborhood, the, the, on my block. Then I go to the neighborhood to liaise with them to figure out how to get the sewage from the neighborhood to my. I go up to the city level and talk to the water and sewage and how do we get to these, all these. It was brilliant. It was really, really simple. And it's that kind of, I think, arrangement that we, we need to look at. Instead of saying, 
pretending that cities have power. Pretending. They have no power at all. Look what happened. One stroke, some guy knocks 30 people off the roster of Toronto, or whatever it was, 42 to 44 to 25, just because he feels like it, because he's supposed to be wiser. <clears throat> it's, it's a come down from the British era. We need that process that I talked about before, these, these working tables, what exactly. We need to look at creating multiple economies. So we need to work with the primary economy, that is the, the wood, the, the timber, the oil sands, if it is oil sands in the proper sense, I mean control properly the agriculture, and spin off from there. We did a lot of work in Africa, working with the impacts of a mine on local people. And the first thing we would find out is, what did they, how did they make their living before the mine? Oh, it was cocoa. So we made sure that the value of the cocoa went up in parallel with the mine price, the gold price. And I think that kind of strategy, to know, take advantage of the layers of using a primary economy to create others is going to be a critical part of the growth out there. Promoting local workforce development. So unreserved populations are expected to increase this just by 2026 in that region to 667. By 2100, they'll be up in the millions. Serious actions required to address historical failures, underfunding, et cetera. We need to create opportunities. They, we don't need to create it for them. They are creating them already. They're using the law very successfully, and they know what to do. They, they've lived with it long enough. We need to promote immigration, obviously. We need to plan simultaneously for environment, resource, commerce, infrastructure, and housing. And I mean simultaneously, like we did in Seton. Seton was driven by, thank you, by the first thing that happened in Seton is the MNR came in and said, here's all the land we want to protect. Then we came in and worked on the planning. I, I think there are a bit problem, it was a bit problematic in, in it, it was a bit one-sided, it was to the, I guess to the good side politically, but it did cause us problems. But I think if you do them together, you're going to get a much better result than trying to do them separately. And we need to look at how to create starter communities, not finished communities. Um, you know, if you think of the all sands, <clears throat> uh, when, when I worked there, we did a plan for the infrastructure in the oil sands called CRISP, a really interesting example. When the province woke up to the fact that oil was a 300-year resource, and they should probably do something about that infrastructure-wise. And one of the things we found out right off the bat is to run a camp for 1,000 men, a work camp for those fly-in, fly-out fly people. 10 years of 10-year camp is a billion dollars. We're paying for it because it's called the cost of mining. So we don't, we, we don't, they take their royalties, we pay for their costs, we pay that billion dollars for 92 camps. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. And we need to look at how we work with existing communities but start new communities and not just as finished things but as, as beginnings. We need a growth plan that could learn a lot of lessons from this one. And we need to identify what are the responsibilities at local, regional, provincial, national levels. And there's my attempt at this. So I'm going to leave this with Bill. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here if people want to check it out. But um, so that's what it looks like today as a, as a, growth, as a growth area that for, for the country. And that's sort of what I begin to imagine could happen at least by 2100. <clears throat> and you can see that we, there's new development around Hudson's Bay, some of the potential port areas. It's, it's not, nothing profound. It's, it's just about like thinking about Western Canada in, in 1890, I think. I don't think, I think we just have to get together and, and work it out. So thank you very much. Glenn Miller, you're first off. John, very inspiring. Thank you for that. So it's 2100, and you're still around because you've got lots of energy. <laughs> and you're giving a commentary to the CBC on how you actually fulfilled that dream. What were the steps that needed to be taken? And give us a timeline for the critical moments in, in moving forward. Yeah. Um, I've actually done that. I mean, it's sort of alluded in there, but I mean, I, I think the first one, like all first steps, is engagement. So, um, and and I think 
engagement, meaningful engagement, means setting those tables. I mean, and setting them in situ, not in Ottawa, or not even in the provincial capital. Setting them in the place. Um, making sure that the balance of membership on that represents the constituency of that table. And I think there's a hierarchy. I, I think you'd probably be starting on, region, on a regional basis. So remember those circles that were in that map that said, this is, these are the areas, these are the regions. Those would be the sub, the regional plans within the corridor. So you'd probably take one, ring of fire would be a, could be one, for example, just for example. Um, so it'd be a series of those out of which would come policy, probably some reasonable startup plans, and then you'd be working on investment. I mean, I don't know. It, we do this all the time, actually, in Africa, because we're, we've got a mine that's coming into the middle of, we don't, the mine pays us, but we don't work, we don't, we're not contracted with them. So we set a table. They pay us to set a table at which the people that are being affected sit, the mine sits, the government sits, and we sit as a secretary to the table. And the first thing we do, which is probably, here's the process, is we elect a chair that everybody agrees with. The very first time we did that was in Ghana. And fortunately, there was a, the, the only FIFA referee in the country was also mining, worked in a mine. So he was the chair. And he had his yellow cards and his red cards. And he, speaking of Irvin, Irvin might be good at this. You know. And, and you know what, you're, you're actually, actually you're, 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 it's like making a treaty. Except not in five, not in five minutes or one day, when, like the old ones. It's, you sit there, and you first you start off with, "I don't want, I don't want you to come here. I'm coming here to make a profit. I don't want you to come here. I'm coming here to make a profit. But I'm also coming to do you something good. Well, maybe. What if you did come? Where would we go anyway? Where would we live? And you, you gradually, I would say. I can tell you that over an 18-month period, you don't, get up from the, you, you don't get up from that table until you have a plan and a workable plan. I mean, down to specifications. And I think, I think everybody actually wants that to happen. And they don't, when they're at the same table, they don't, they don't blast off. They may go away and blast off to the press or whatever, but they don't do it at the table. They never would do that. There's always respect at that. I don't care who the mining company is and who the, and I, I could see that that, uh, that would, Sometimes we were dealing with quite large regions. I, I can see that working in a hierarchical way. And I just do not believe it's that complicated. I, I mean, I don't, I don't believe it's all that much more complicated than figuring out how, to, how they figure out Western Canada. Because I think everybody wants this. I don't think it's, there's, there's opposition or there's angst, or there's, but there's no place to voice. It's like living in Toronto. You can never, you, you, you can never know what's going on. You have to go and see your counselor, and then he, they have enormous power. It's nothing to do with governing the city. It's about how they control development in your area. And they either let you know or they don't let you know. And you're just, it's not open. And I think everybody's looking for someone. They're not, they don't want that all again. Even if it's 25, we can complain about that, and it was better with 44. It's still the same. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what your options are. And so you just find out at the last moment that there's a huge apartment building right up next to you, and you, all you can do is make a fool of yourself at the OMB or at this new organization. But I think people will sit, and they'll talk, and, and they'll negotiate if, if, when they see their stake in it. So I, I'm a big, it's an aboriginal idea. I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, his Excellency, the former husband of the former Governor General, wrote a book about it, The Métis Nation. He talked about this. He, he keeps saying you need to set those tables. And I think he's right. John, over here. Sean, next. I'm a uh, professor here at Seneca. Yeah. Um, very good presentation, looking at a lot of the uh, interprovincial, interterritorial collaboration that's required. And one of the biggest obstacles I see in this is a lack of federal interest in uh, land use planning matters. So one, do we need it? And uh, number two, how long do we see it happening if we do? Um, yeah, we do need it. Um, I, I think that <laughs> I, I think somebody. I mean, they they have to be involved in planning, and 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 they sort of are, but you know, not in a hands-on way, I guess. And I think that um, that that's almost a, that's a that's a whole issue. To, that's a whole other presentation, but. Uh, 
I think land use and transportation are at the core of this from a planning point of view. And there, you've got to look at it as a country, not as 10 provinces and some regions. You've got to look at it in the big picture, as I think people looked at Western Canada at the time. Even, I would say, even how people looked at Upper Canada in 1790. Because remember, I mean, those are people that just lost 13 colonies. And they hold up here and they try to figure out what, how did, what are we going to lose the, four, they, they thought this was still the best, the 14th colony. What, what are we going to do? Like, how did we lose that? And everybody said, well, it was a tea party. But it actually wasn't a tea party at all. It was land. If you read the history, you know, somewhere between 1759, when George Washington fought for the British at Quebec, and 1776, when he was in a, when led a civil war against his own people, something fundamental happened. And what happened is that the land off the land, he, he married the daughter of Lord Fairfax. And Lord Fairfax was in charge of Virginia County, Fairfax County in Virginia, which is a huge, sort of Lord Talbot down on Lake Erie, one of those kind of situations. And Lord Fairfax said, dear son-in-law, could you lay out some communities for my people to manage all this operation? And he did. And the, Colonial office came along and said, George, we respect you. You're a very important person and wonderful guy, but you, you, you can't do this. You know, what do you mean, can't do what? You can't survey land and give it away to people without permission of the queen. What? He, by the way, he was the youngest surveyor in American history. He was a surveyor at the age of 13, which, of course, is why he was a great soldier as well. And he refused to accept that. And, he, and of course, the people he gave him the land to really refused, so they became his army. They weren't even an army. They were a demonstration. They were marching to Boston to protest what was happening. And they started being fired on. And you had a revolution. Um, it was land. that I think the British lost control of land. They said, OK, so what we'll do in Upper Canada is we'll survey the whole place up into townships, concessions, lots. And we'll hand every lot out one at a time ourselves. And if you're in the family compact, you get in concession one. If you're in officer of the British Army, you get into concession too. If you're an NCO, NGO, uh, or uh, 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 you know, corporal or something, you're in concession three. If you're a private or you're with a, my family were Dutch, and you're so sympathetic, you got concession four and five. If you're a Scottish, you got six and seven. If you're Irish, you go into eight and nine. It was that simple. But I mean, they, they planned it. They organized it. They, it was all to do with roads and infrastructure and land itself. It's all infrastructure and land. It's not about buildings. It's about fundamental stuff. The professor over here gets to talk about it in the fifth year of people leaving here. She should be talking about her first year. It's really important, the infrastructure and how you deal with that from the beginning and how you make sure that it's not just big stuff or big. It, it, it includes land for people to settle in as well as, um, as drive a train through. Um, hi, my name is Leroy Murray. Uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, need a bit more time. And I might, my thought is, uh, it may be off topic, but uh, I was wondering where does AI and uh, robotics and the high-tech uh, sort of development fit into your plan uh, of Canada's future, especially when one's facing a world where that is providing so much gravitas to countries' development. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I, I don't know if I'm the one to do that, but if I, if I look at the Northwest Passage alone, and I see that in five years, there will be three ships going by me every day, I would be up there setting up a, a point to, dis to offload, to get down to Montreal and Toronto and Regina or whatever, and to do that, I'd be probably using robotics out the yin yang because I don't have people up there to draw on. So I'd be, I'd be really going to maximize that kind of opportunity. In the development of that. In the development. Yes, where is Canada uh, developing that sort of technology, that, that ability, that capability to deal with those questions which yeah. seemingly are very specific to Canada? Yeah. And, that, and then can become a a kickoff point for other other countries to share in that. Yeah, all I, um, all I can say, I know my own world was this development. And yesterday, I was talking with an a, a Italian developer, a woman called Julie Di Lorenzo. And she was saying, you know, she develops buildings. She said she can't believe 
we've been developing, as, as, as another friend of mine says, we're in the 20th year of the seven year build. You know, we've been building since 19. And she said, we still haven't developed skill. We don't have people who make really good materials, really good windows, really good doors, really good. We still, we haven't taken advantage of it. We just let it roll over us. So I think it's something that we have to direct to, to the cause. I mean, you use this, this inf uses population growth alone to, to sort of pre, prepare for that opportunity. I, I don't know what else to say. And, and I, I think we probably, like we learn a lot from Africa and cell phones, because they, they actually really figured out how to really use a cell phone to raise money and transfer land. And I think we could talk to those people and people in those rapidly developing areas and learn a lot from them about how to, what does this mean and how do we, um, how do we deal, how will we help? Could you come here and help us deal with this? Because I think they really could. John, we're gonna be talking in the second half of this about biocapacity and biodiversity and issues of that sort. Um, maybe this is a fastball down the center of the plate, but how do you, um, how do you square the circle, as it were, um, if you develop uh, areas of the Boreal Corridor, you're going to uh, remove aspects of trees that sequester carbon, biodiversity, yeah. biocapacity, I know, et it's a huge challenge. I, I met yesterday with a Métis nation who are really interesting. I don't, I don't know if I quite get it yet, but they are huge. They're trans-Canada, and they report directly to the Queen because they never made any kind of arrangement with anybody. And their whole idea is CLT, you know, um, cross-laminated timber. And they came to me and they bought me pictures of railway bridges, road crossings, frames that hold pipelines, uh, large infrastructural elements built in CLT, which apparently structurally it can do. And their whole idea is to actually produce that Remember, even if we, and we should have the Eastern Pipeline, would have to be part of this, I still, I think it's an important part. Any, any pipeline that's going across the country will have to be driven, especially if it's coming with the oil sense, has to be driven by electricity. So every 200 kilometers, you need a new push, because you're pushing heavy water, heavy oil, I mean. And you're actually building an energy chain when you do that. So you put that, there's an area where you, you've got to get that line straight, but you're doing it knowing that people will settle along it. So you use that as a way of concentrating development along there as opposed to spreading it out. So it's, we're talking corridors of development, not blobs. You know? Well, thank you very much, John. Um, I, as always, um, going back 45 years, I've always enjoyed your uh, ideas and inspiration and um, your talks. I remember that, I think it was 2015 when I was looking up this, I came and talked about this topic here. Yes. And that really was the beginning of really thinking about it. So thank you for the opportunity to come Great. Back.